Before we start today's show, we want to invite you to stick around at the end of the episode to enjoy a preview of a new podcast that premieres on July 14th. As the industry's exclusive cannabis podcast network, MJ Bulls is proud to present Women Leading in Cannabis. Join host Kira Reed each week for inspirational discussions with women who are leading the cannabis industry. Welcome to another episode of Hemp Barons. I'm Dan Humiston, and on today's show, we have a renewable economy pioneer. Using patented technology, this hemp company is converting non-food biomass into three value-added products. This exciting breakthrough technology is making biorefinery more economical, faster, and more environmentally friendly. Let's join Joy's conversation with Ed Lurenberger from Pure Vision Technology. Well, hello, Ed. Thank you so much for being with us today on Hemp Aaron. Well, it's a pleasure. I have been a, just an admirer of yours for years now. What Pure Hemp Technology is doing for the advancement of the valuable, versatile hemp crop and plant and all that it can do is really unmatched in so many ways around the globe. Can you tell us a little bit, and then I'm excited to get into the history of it, tell us a little bit about what biorefining fractionalization technology is, what pure hemp technology does. Okay. Well, we call it our continuous countercurrent reactor technology. And what this technology results in is starting with, for instance, hemp stalks and fractionating the primary components of the stalks into three fractions. The first fraction being uh, pulp or the cellulose portion. The second fraction being the lignin, L-I-G-N-I-N fraction. And the third fraction being the hemicellulose, or we further break it down into xylose. So in a very short amount of time, we feed hemp stalks in, and we end up with three fractions of pulp lignin, and hemicellulose or xylose. And from those three fractions, thousands and thousands of products can be made. Correct. The pulp, which uh, I'm, I'm very proud to say we just finished our first paper run at a domestic paper mill. So we fed hemp stalks through the reactor. About 50% of the dry weight of the product coming out is pulp, and we sent about 500 pounds of pulp to a paper mill in Michigan, and they ran it and made, we made about two miles of hemp paper. And this was a huge milestone, not only for us, but really for the United States. We're now making hemp paper at a paper mill and soon to be paper mills, which is a big deal. And we're now working with other companies to find homes for this amazing hemp paper that we made. And our target was to make a thick paper stock for board, cards, and packaging. So we're, as of today, open for business to help move our two miles of paper so we can do our next run, which we plan to have about 10 miles of hemp paper. So that's the pulp. This is so exciting. So, so that's on the pulp side. We can also further refine the pulp into uh, glucose. So we have methods, and we've done this a number of times, where we enzymatically hydrolyze the pulp into glucose. And once you have the glucose, which is a six-carbon sugar, we're able to ferment that into many different products. and. This is the beginning of the refinery where you start with fermentable sugars and from the fermentable sugars, you can go into many different directions as far as consumer products and industrial products. So that's on the pulp side, the lignin side and uh, lig. And I just, and let me just get in there for a second. So certainly pulps on paper, paper and packaging and cards, so important. But I also know that you folks 
are looking into and see the full potential here and have even created some tissue paper and are looking for pulp for and looking to even personal hygiene products and of course building products on the pulp side as well. 100% accurate. We have made pulp from wheat straw that went into make, making gorgeous toilet paper and paper towels. Now that was a 14 month concentrated program that we did with the third party that, uh, you know, it cost about $2 million for us to develop that data. We have yet to do that with hemp, and all the work that we're doing now is self-funded. So we're definitely looking for collaborators to assist us in, in funding the research and development to take hemp and go into different directions like toilet paper, like hygiene products. And we've got some preliminary data on all of these. And, you know, we're just trying to stay focused on one thing at a time. And, and our one thing was making pulp to make paper. And so now we're kind of in that groove. We're also flooring the very unique uh, properties of hemp lignin. And we're doing amazing research and development. And we've got collaborations with different universities, and we're sending them our hemp lignin, and we're perhaps one of the only companies in the world making hemp lignin, and the data that we're generating with our collaborators is phenomenal, and it's, and it's data that no one's ever seen before. Relating to the, the high reactivity of the hemp lignin and how it can be a direct replacement for petroleum feedstocks. So exciting. This is fantastic. The third fraction is the hemicellulose, which is a much thinner fiber than the thick cellulose fiber. And in our continuous countercurrent reactor technology, we're able to convert that long fiber, thin fiber, into a liquid inside the reactor. So it, it enters as a hemp stock where 20% is the hemicellulose and it exits as a liquid. And the liquid is now considered to be a long chain or a ligomeric xylose. And xylose is a five carbon sugar. And this, like the lignin and like the cellulose, is a raw material that can be made into many industrial and consumer products. So these three fractions result in providing raw materials to make, you know, a myriad of uh, products for all of us. Including plastics, sweeteners, composites, chemicals, nutraceuticals, resins, sealers, all along those lines. Am I correct? All yes. The above. Yes. It's just incredible. And, uh, and you folks didn't come to this lightly. This is technology that the Pure Vision team has that you and your brother Carl, and I know your colleague, who I believe is now retired, Dr. Dick Wingerson, have developed and patented this technology in the 90s. Am I correct? And then Pure Vision then licenses this patented biorefining fractionalization technology to Pure Hemp technology, which, of course, all owned by you guys. Is that correct? Yeah. The CCR technology was developed by Dr. Wingerson in 1999. And so mm -hmm. we've been advancing it and then scaling it up for these years. And now it's pretty much ready to be scaled up to a small industrial scale. And our current scale is a half ton per day continuous pilot plant. And we definitely have enough data to advance in our next scale is planned to be a four ton per day, which is a very conservative scale up. And from the four ton, we plan to go to a full commercial scale of 50 tons per day, which oh, in the wow. scheme of industrial scale is still relatively small. So we've got our work cut out for us for the next five years. And as I'm on this interview, just let the, the, your listeners know that we're very active in the R&D and the scale-up, 
all this takes investment funds. So we're seeking investment uh, collaborators to help us build more and more hemp refineries to replace oil refineries uh, as soon as possible. And it's purehemptech.com, by the way, purehemptech.com, where we can learn about all of those opportunities. And in fact, it's your extensive experience in biomass for all of those years that inspired the state of Colorado when it began to explore the reintroduction and the reemergence of, again, this versatile, valuable crop in Colorado, where you were appointed originally to serve on the uh, Colorado Hemp Advisory Board, which formed in 2013, and you now serve as the chairman of, of the board of directors of the uh, Colorado Hemp Advisory Board. Am I correct? That is correct. Uh, it's, uh, I'm obviously quite honored to serve as the chairman of this uh, group that Yeah, when we started meeting in 2013, hemp was illegal everywhere in the United States. Colorado was the only state that legalized hemp, but it was still illegal because we didn't have rules and regs to follow to grow hemp. So 2014 was the first legal sow and the first legal harvest. And so we were in processing hemp from day one. and so, and, and like you say, I'm still on the committee and now been in, invited to be the chairman. And it's quite an honor. And we're still kicking. We are so grateful for all. You are the busiest man in hemp. And we are so grateful for all of the time that you put in to advance the crop, to educate everybody, to create policies and, and, and inspire infrastructure here so that we deliver on the promise of this incredible plant. And now you're also the board of directors of CHAMP, which is the Colorado Hemp Advancement and Management Plan, a new sort of offshoot of the, or within the Colorado Department of Agriculture, again, to continue to uh, make sensible and manageable plans for all of the many aspects of, of this plant, everything from banking and finance, processing, manufacturing, marketing. As you know, the CHAMP subcommittees span all of the areas that affect the huge hemp industry, as it were. And and let's talk about the the history a a little bit of the very plants that we're talking about. Now, Pure Hemp is located based in Fort Lupton. And I know, I think it was in 1993, you'd made a little bit of money in real estate and finance, and you're quite a musician as well. So but knew your vision and intellectual that you are and planetary healer that you are invested in a piece of real estate, a group of eight cannery operations buildings that functioned as the Fort Lux and Canning Co. Uh, from 1898 to 1979. Is that, is that true? It was the, the operation was the canning company for nearly a hundred years. That is all very accurate. It started in 1898 and they shut the doors in 1979. And the Fort Lupton Canning Company uh, took local produce from farmers, uh, canned the produce, and provided canned goods, vegetables, to about a four-state region. And with the advancement of mass production, these mom-and-pop canneries around the country, uh, within about four years, uh, all went down. And so I, in 1993, purchased this industrial property, uh, which has, like you say, about eight buildings, 110,000 square feet of buildings on eight and a half acres. And we're slowly converting the entire property into a hemp refinery. So (laughs) one building at a time. Gosh, and and what became sort of the financial backbone of Pure Vision, which is is obviously we, we refer to as Pure Hemp, is you, my understanding is that you then converted sort of one building at a time into storage, A to Z. So of course, now it's being and has been long since being converted into the hemp processing and, and for the biorefinery uh, technologies, um, fractionalization technologies. But storage unit, is, is that what had provided the originally the financial backbone for Pure Vision and Pure Hemp? You're getting into the rich history here, Joy. And I guess I'm quite proud to, to share the same story that when I bought the property in 1973, the first thing I did was build mini storage units. And the next year I had to build more because they got rented out and the 
third year, I built more. So these 200 mini storage units in other outbuildings that I've rented have been the financial backbone to keep Pure Hemp and, and Pure Vision going for the last 20 years. So it's part of the rich history. And now we're converting uh, the, the storage buildings back into processing biomass like they were originally designed to do uh, in, in the 1940s when most of the buildings were built. So it's quite a crazy change of events that's taking place there now. As a matter of fact, one of the buildings that we're totally remodeling right now uh, it was an old warehouse, and we're turning it into our second clean room uh, that's, you know, by the time it's done, it's going to be a very sophisticated ISO 7 rated clean room. So, yeah, we're, wow. we're making it better than it was. I know that also you folks are processing certain materials that are available for sale now. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the various herbs that you're processing and other ingredient suppliers, so to speak, or materials that are available right now for, for manufacturers to purchase? Yeah. Let me just first say this, that what is paying for our research and development and advancement of our hemp refining program is uh, our spin-off company and our brand, Pure Kind Botanicals. So the, most of the products that we're selling are what most people in our industry are used to, which is uh, cannabinoid-infused products. So we have tinctures and topicals and so forth. So those are something that uh, we sell every day. We also are selling small quantities of lignin and of pulp, and now we're selling large quantities of paper, and we're also uh, selling small quantities of xylose. And we're targeting companies and universities to take these unique 100% hemp-based raw materials to start doing research and development to find homes for these unique starting materials. So by all means, your audience, if you're interested in working with us in getting small samples of these uh, starting materials, let us know. And the goal will be to work toward buying rail car quantities of these same raw materials to make products on the industrial scale. And your website has such great, the, the technology tab, I just think is so useful. It really, you, you do a wonderful job of taking some very complicated science and explaining it in layman's terms so folks can, uh, can understand it. So again, we're talking about a plant that meets all of the needs of humanity. So human and animal nutrition, nutraceuticals, body care, pharmaceuticals, uh, paper, textiles, building materials, biocomposites, nanotechnology, industrial sealants and coatings. I mean, somebody stop me. And you folks, Ed Lerberger, at Pure Hunt Technology, have the science to really maximize all of these uh, all of these aspects of this plant, as you say, the, the cellulose, the hemicellulose, and the linen. And, and for our listeners, linen is the property in plants simplistically that sort of gives them their rigidity and, and certain protection. So when you punch a tree, you, you hurt your hand. There's so much linen in that tree. Um, there is about 20% linen. Am I right, Ed? 20% yes. linen in the hemp plant? Yes. 20% uh, linen in the hemp plant. So yeah, so lignin, L-I-G-N-I-N, lignin is uh, one of the most prominent polymers, natural polymers on the planet. So trees typically have 25% lignin, and, and most other plants uh, have closer to 20%, but it's, it's evolved to be a very important polymer found everywhere in nature. And so when we eat lettuce or broccoli or other biomass, we're actually eating some lignin. So it's part of all forms of nature, and we couldn't live without lignin. On a molecular level, it is a very complex molecule 
and it's a fascinating molecule. And the most prominent source of lignin on the planet, it comes out of the pulp and paper industry. And when uh, you have very large pulp producers, how to make paper is to remove the lignin from the wood chips. So pulping all over the planet is all about removing lignin because lignin has qualities that doesn't make for good paper. So they remove the lignin and the state of the art for the industry is to condense this and dry this lignin and use it as boiler fuel to help fuel the pulping and, and paper making operations. And this is a great use for lignin, but in our world, lignin is much more valuable than using it for boiler fuel when we can use it as the raw material, the primary raw material to make plastics and other, you know, high value added products. No, that's what we, we want to be maximizing this, as you say, fascinating and complex molecule for all that it is worth. It's kind of like when folks say, hey, we can make biodiesel fuel out of hemp seed oil. And yes, we can. But it is such a valuable, complex oil, the oil pressed from the hemp seed that we would not want to use it just to be burned as a fuel. There are so many incredible things that we can do with it. And I think also it's important for to, to bring home the fact that so there's 25% linen in trees. A, we don't want to cut trees down. We need trees for oxygen and for the bios. Um, and also, it takes an incredible amount of chemicals to break down the linen that's in trees versus breaking down the linen that's in hemp. Is that correct as well? Ed? Yeah, Joy, you're spot on. We don't need to cut down trees to make paper and packaging products. And, you know, the trees that we do cut down on this planet, you know, they're anywhere from 7 to 35 years old to grow a, a good tree for pulp. And we grow hemp in, what, 90 to 120 days. And so yep. let's save those trees to absorb and suck up the carbon, and let's use ag residues and hemp stalks to make our toilet paper and paper towels and paper and packaging. And so, uh, yeah, that's what it's all about. And re-energize the farming industry and, and employ regenerative agricultural practices that will heal the soil and rebuild the soil and really heal this planet up. And and I think also important for the listeners to know that, that, you know, we have to use a lot of bleach to make tree paper, all of the dioxins that that adds into the water table, not necessary for the production of hemp paper, especially if we can all get used to the beautiful creamy color instead of this addiction to bleached white, which is unnecessary. What do you say about that, Ed? Uh, spot on again. We, mm. <laughs> as a society, must move away from the from the bleach white look and embrace the natural colors of you know the product that we're making. So the hemp paper that we just made is is not bleached white. We did mix it with bleached pulp, so it's kind of an off white. But the more percentage hemp that goes into our paper and our products, we don't want to add any bleach, and so we'll have kind of a natural tannish color looking product. And so we as an industry really want to embrace this. And if you want to have a white look, well, you can have your white bio-based ink or your colorful inks that you can apply to the hemp paper and you can have it any color you want. But yeah, as a society, we must move away from the thought that everything has to be bleached with chemicals and start gravitating toward the natural look and, and feel of the plant. It's beautiful. It's healthy. Let's do it. And I wrote, I know, an article about you and Pure Vision for Marijuana Venture Magazine way back in 2015. And there's a quote here that I have. You said, everything you can do with oil, you can do with biomass and seed stocks. And that the focus of this company is to get away from trees and to be tree free. Still feeling that way today, Ed? Yes, but moreover, you know, trees are 
incredible plants. We love to see them and have them in our environment. We do not love to see oil refineries in our environment. So what we're all about is promoting hemp and biomass refineries to replace oil refineries. And yes, we can take the sugars and the lignin that are prominent part of all plants that grow and use these stalks and stems and biomass as the raw material to make just about anything that comes out of an oil refinery. And we don't need to go to war. We don't need to spend billions protecting the Middle East transportation routes. And we don't need to invest in these crazy things that our country has historically invested in to support an oil economy. And like you said, let's embrace the farming community. Let's have all of this uh, happen domestically. And we don't need government subsidies. And let's stop all this craziness and let's get back to the roots. Love it. Ed, thank you for everything that you and that your brother and that the Pure Vision, Pure Hemp, and Pure Kind team do for the planet. And again, specifically to advance the crop, you're really carrying the water and chopping the wood for the reemergence of this crop on so many levels. So not only are you leading the most promising, you know, technology that we have here to maximize and deliver on the promise of this plant, but your, the nonprofit positions that you hold in the state of Colorado, which in so many ways leads the nation and North America and the globe. Thank you for all that you do for this plant and for the planet and for us, Ed. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you, Joy. Those are quite nice accolades. And it's my pleasure. My name is Kira Reed, and I'd like to invite you to be inspired by the women who are leading in the cannabis industry. Each week, we will discuss empowerment, leadership, and what it means to be a woman in charge in marijuana, hemp, and CBD. As the founder of the Women Empowered in Cannabis community, I have had the great pleasure to get to know many brilliant and talented women who are CEOs, executives, politicians, advocates, and community leaders that are focused on creating a cannabis economy that is just, fair, and equal. We'll learn how these women make decisions, how they navigate a predominantly male industry, and what they're doing to level the playing field for women. I hope you'll join us.